Good morning. This is the third part of the, this special workshop about CKD progression. In the first part, I discussed the definition of chronic kidney disease, why CKD is an important disease, and I mentioned the risk factors and the contributing factors for CKD and CKD progression. Then I discussed the age, gender, hypertension, and diabetes. In the second part, I mentioned uh, seven factors, acute kidney injury and its relationship to chronic kidney disease, obesity and nutritional aspects, blood kidney access, physical inactivity and the chronic kidney disease progression, smoking, hyperglycemia and sleep disorder. In the third part, I'm going to discuss the metabolic acidosis and its relationship to chronic kidney disease and the CKD progression. Then, uh, an example for the drug and its implication in the process of CKD progression. I'm not going to discuss many drugs, but just a sample for the correlation of drugs and chronic kidney disease. Then, uh, some slides about the progression of leucistic kidney disease, other risk factors, and some advances and the ideas for basic research in the future. And at the end, I'll conclude the, this workshop and uh, reaching the final statements. So let us start with the, these questions. So as I did in the first two parts, I'll start with some statements. And Dr. Karim and Dr. Samar, here for each statement, I just want to hear, for, hear from you if the statement is true or false. The first statement, both metabolic acidosis and subclinical metabolic acidosis are a real are real risk factors for chronic kidney disease. True. True. What about subclinical metabolic acidosis? How to diagnose it? By lab, lab only, not manifested as a patient. What's meant by lab only? By EBG, pH below seven point three five. This is subclinical. By carb level. Oh, uh, 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 what is the definition of subclinical according to by carb level? Less than. Uh, Less than 24, 20, I don't know the number. Okay, let, let us go. Subclinical acidosis <coughs> is defined as a serum bicarbonate is between 20 to 22. Is it right or wrong? True or false? Maybe right. Okay. Uh, TRC101 increases bicarbonate through exchanging hydrogen ion by sodium. This is a new drug, and I know that you will not uh, hear about it. Okay. The use of anticoagulant safely, to use anticoagulant safely, it is advisable to monitor kidney function. Yes. yes. True. Creating a fistula increases the progression of chronic kidney disease. Maybe true, maybe false. Okay. Uh, collectin 11 promotes uh, fibrosis. So we don't Novel CD36 targeting peptides have shown efficacy in slowing the progression of CKD. I know all these are within the advances that I mentioned at the end. Let's go to the uh, first uh, factor in this third part, which is metabolic acidosis. This table is very important because these are the risk factors for metabolic acidosis. So low GFR is associated with twofold higher risk of stage three, and seven higher risk for stage four. So the lower the GFR, the higher the percentage of metabolic acidosis. So we can expect metabolic acidosis to be with advanced CKD. Lower ammonium excretion is associated with 2.5 fold higher risk of acidosis. If it is if ammonium excretion is less than 15 milliequivalent per day in comparison to the level above 25. Do you know why? Why the lower ammonium excretion is associated with higher risk of acidosis? Because this is a physiology of dealing with acid. If there is acid Secretion load, acid. the kidney mm -hmm. excretes hydrogen ion through creating ammonium chloride. So ammonia plus hydrogen ion equal ammonium. And this is a way to uh, get rid of hydrogen ion. So if the kidney uh, power to uh, secrete ammonia 
is reduced, acidosis will develop. I think it's rational. And I'll explain in a minute the relationship between ammonium excretion and the metabolic acidosis because it's not an, a simple issue. Hyperkalemia uh, increases the risk of acidosis by 2.4 uh, folds. Albuminuria associated with increasing uh, the risk factor uh, by these two folds. And then smoking increases acidosis by 43%. Anemia increases acidosis. Higher serum albumin, 35% to higher risk of acidosis for H1 gram per deciliter increase in albumin. Diuretic uh, use is uh, protective against acidosis. It decreases the risk by 30%. And I think it is, it is already known. All diuretics can lead to alkalosis. Uh, except acetazolamide. Okay. Uh, uh, regarding metabolic acidosis, what is the link between metabolic and acidosis and the progression of chronic kidney disease? And if there is hydrogen ion retention, so this will lead to reduction of pH of interstitial fluid of the kidney and decreasing intracellular pH of the renal tubular cells. With subsequent activation of angiotensin aldosterone uh, axis, endothelin axis, increasing pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, increasing NH3 with activation of complement because excess ammonium excretion stimulate the complement activation. All these pathways can lead to interstitial fibrosis and the progression of chronic kidney disease. So this is the association of metabolic acidosis with chronic kidney disease progression. In children, this study shows the lower the serum bicarb. Here, if the serum bicarb is less than 18, as you see, renal survival is uh, significantly reduced in children. So, metabolic acidosis in children is associated with progression of chronic kidney disease toward uh, end stage kidney disease. Here, I want to raise this relatively recent concept in medicine, which is subclinical metabolic acidosis. Subclinical metabolic acidosis means that serum by curve is normal. normal. But, but how I can say it is subclinical? By measuring the uh, acid excretion and by measuring ammonium. So if you have a patient with a uh, normal range by curve, usually in the range of 22-23 milligram per liter, and you can find ammonium excretion is very high. What does it mean? This means that the kidney generates a lot of ammonia to get rid of, of hydrogen ion. This means that there is excess acid and the kidney up to this moon can compensate. But in the expense of excess ammonium excretion, and as I mentioned in the previous figure, that excess ammonium is associated with activation of inflammation and complement so it can increase the risk of fibrosis so if we measure urine ammonium and you can find it high in the presence of normal serum by car this means that there is excess acid so if we give the patient in this moment bicarbonate therapy this will calm down everything and protect the kidney against fibrosis so this raises the concept of giving by car not only for those who have low bicarb, but for those who have normal bicarb, but excess acid excretion by the kidney. And this is by measuring the urine ammonium. So we can measure urine ammonium to predict preclinical acidosis. Or in the, here, this is the study that was published to diagnose incomplete dysteria tuba acidosis by giving ferrosomide and ephedrocortisone. So this is the way of diagnosing the either the preclinical or incomplete RTA. Regarding urine ammonium, it is not a simple task that in acidosis there, there is excess urine ammonium excretion. Because, as I mentioned, the kidney may be the cause of acidosis. If the kidney is the cause of acidosis, excretion of ammonium will be reduced so, so you can measure ammonia in the presence of acidosis and you find it low, this means the kidney is the cause of acidosis. So this is one point. Or 
if there is renal dysfunction and if there is acidosis, what will happen to the functional nephron? The functional nephron will increase their capacity for producing ammonia. This will increase the level of ammonium within the, these nephrons that will stimulate fibrosis. So it seems that both high urine ammonium and low ammonium level are associated with problems. Okay? This study addressed the issue of urine ammonium as a predictor for clinical outcome in hypertensive kidney disease. So this is the urine uh, ammonium, milli equivalent per day, and this is uh, milli equivalent per kilogram per day, and this is the level, total, this is the 19.5, uh, 10.5, uh, this is the total, and this is for the tertile one, or quartile one, and the quartile two, and the quartile three. So here, we have three levels of urine ammonium. Okay, let us correlate here the, uh, if uh, within the progression of chronic kidney disease, urine ammonium is reduced. So the urine ammonium is reduced with advanced CKD, and low ammonium in the urine predict death or indecision and disease in participants without acidosis. And this is important to note. When to measure urine ammonia if, if we find if urine by carb is on the low normal range, we can we can imagine that there is subclinical acidosis and we can monitor urine ammonium at this point. Because even with, for persons who are healthy, we can make checkup for creatinine. So if you have any degree of uh, chronic kidney disease, and we find, uh, I think this is the, uh, there is no recommendation about this, but if you find a degree of chronic kidney disease, stage two or stage early stage three, and you find serum bicarb is within low normal range, we can expect that there is subclinical acidosis, and we can, we can monitor urine ammonia. Okay. Here, this is another uh, point that uh, excess urine ammonium is associated with the pathology, as we mentioned before. We mentioned in the beginning it's associated with complement activation. And here it's associated with TGF-beta-1. And TGF-beta-1 is the mediator of fibrosis. This is why the here, if you look here, the higher the ammonium, the higher TGF. This means that high ammonium in comparison to uh, urine pH, serum bicarb, or urine acids are associated with TGF-beta. So up to this moment, we should think of urine ammonium. In the past, it was very difficult to measure urine ammonium. But currently, in the lab, uh, we, may, we, may measure, we can measure uh, urine ammonium. Don't forget that if you find low urine ammonium, this means, and in the presence of acidosis, this means that the kidney is the cause of acidosis. But if you find high urine ammonium, this is a compensation phase to get rid of hydrogen ion excess and you can find serum bicarb within normal range in this uh, situation. This is the new drug. This is a study of the new drug, uh, TRC101. What this drug? This is an acid binding drug. So it binds HCl. So it reduces uh, hydrogen and increases bicarbonate without exchanging with sodium. And this is a, uh, I think it's a very benefit, beneficial effect in comparison to sodium bicarb therapy. Because in sodium bicarb therapy, we increase serum bicarb, bicarb but in the, with the expense of increasing sodium. sodium. So there is an exchange of sodium. Yes. Here, no exchange of sodium. I think it's advantage. And if you look, this is the, the study uh, flow. And here, with different concentration of this drug, serum bicarb improves, increases. And when the drug is withdrawn, serum bicarb decreases. So we are waiting further studies to show us the value of this new camer in managing metabolic acidosis. And to avoid overload induced by sodium bicarbonate. Regarding drugs, uh, as we as said before, that the majority of drugs in medicine are potentially nephrotoxic. Okay, but there are some famous drugs like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like many drugs. But here I give two examples about anticoagulants. We don't like anticoagulants in the presence of chronic kidney disease or in dialysis patients, especially warfarin, because warfarin 
it can lead to vascular calcification. This is a very recent article showing the renal outcomes in anticoagulated patients with atrial fibrillation. Here, this is the uh, number of patients who are treated with Abix, um, Abixaban, Dabigatran, uh, Rivaroxaban, and Warfarin. All these are the direct oral anticoagulant that they don't need INR monitoring. And this is warfarin. And here, the key message is, if we think of renal outcome, it seems that direct oral anticoagulants, especially these drugs, the, here, if you look here, the, the adjusted for hazard risk for chronic kidney disease. Here is, uh, if the reference is warfarin, you can find here 0.79 in Riva Ruxaban and uh, 0.7 in Dabagatran. And you can, you can fix this slide and, and look at different parameters, 30% decline of GFR, doubling of creatinine, acute kidney injury, and kidney failure. It seems that the new drugs are a little bit associated with better kidney outcome in comparison to warfarin. But take care because they uh, need modification. So this is an old slide since uh, 2016 discussing the issue of anticoagulation related nephropathy. And within this uh, uh, article, there's a recommendation to uh, uh, look at uh, kidney function, to monitor kidney function for patients on warfarin and for patients treated with direct oral anticoagulant. But look here, within the initiation phase for, for the first three months, monitor kidney function every three to four weeks in both classes. And then uh, according to the level of kidney function, here in warfarin, in comparison to the direct oral anticoagulant, there is recommendation for more frequent monitoring to kidney function. Okay. The most important risk factor for occurrence of anticoagulant-related nephropathy are high serum creatinine or presence of baseline chronic kidney disease and targeting high level of INR above three. So we should be cautious about these points. Regarding the second example of the drugs is PPI, proton pump inhibitors. In this study and other previous studies, it is uh, clear that the use of proton pump inhibitors are associated with adverse renal outcome. Either doubling of creatinine, increased 30% of decline in estimated GFR, or occurrence of indecision on the, on the long run. So the uh, new findings in this study is in a large Swedish cohort, individuals who started proton pump inhibitor therapy were at a higher risk of CKD progression than those who started with H2 receptor antagonist. The risk association increased with higher cumulative PPI exposure. Uh, this is very important and we should raise this announcement to all nephrologists, to all doctors, physicians treating patients with PPI. PPI is a very fantastic class of drugs to be given when it is extremely indicated, but for a period of time. And to avoid using them unnecessarily for a long period of time. Because a lot of side effects can be mentioned uh, regarding the use of PPI. And the term of deprescription should be adopted. Deprescription means, uh, as, as uh, uh, said by Professor Maha Sabala in her excellent presentation, is either to cut to uh, decrease the dose or to interrupt the drug for a period of time or to uh, even to uh, check to H2 receptor blocker. So this is the way of thinking of the prescription. Regarding polycystic kidney disease, this is the pro-PKT score. Did you hear about it before? I think in my presentation since two years, I mentioned the pro-PKT score. So the component of this score, if the patient is male, give one point. If female, zero point. If there is first urological event before 35 years, two points. If no, zero. If hypertension develops below 35 years of age, two points. If no, zero. Uh, if, the, if, we, if we did or performed genetic mutation and we find 
non-truncating mutation, the score is 2. If it's truncating mutation, the uh, score is 4. The higher the score, the higher the risk for progression uh, toward end stage kidney disease. And we consider the patient is low risky if the total score is between zero to th zero to three, and the intermediate risk if it's between four and six, and if the score total score is above seven, this is of high risk for progression. And this is a new article showing that if this is a baseline, the ba here one uh, hundred and thirty-two patients were in the low risk group and 344 in the intermediate risk group, and 273 within the high risk group. What happened after three years here, all patients in the low risk here, uh, three, three patients developed intermediate risk. So three patients from the low risk uh, changed their uh, character and their score into the, uh, the range of intermediate risk. And 11 patients within the intermediate risk became high risk. So this means that this, this risk scoring is beneficial. And if we serially look at the, uh, this pro-BKD score, we can predict the progression of polycystic kidney disease. Another interesting data about overweight and obesity, the higher the body mass index, the bigger the body mass index, the higher the risk of progression. So the, if this is the total annual percentage change in total kidney volume, in a normal weight person, if the, if the person is overweight, this will be the uh, annual change. And if the patient's obese, this is, as you see, there is a significant increase in total kidney volume. So this means that obesity is bad, and we should combat obesity in polycystic kidney disease patients. And this is the association of body mass index with annual percent change in total kidney volume. As you see, uh, there is increase uh, the hazard from one to 1.84, and here threefold, threefold in the, uh, in the zone of obesity. So obesity is bad, and it can predict the progression of polycystic kidney disease. Other player is the FGF23 in the serum. So the higher the serum, FGF23, the higher the risk of progression, according to the data, uh, uh, came from the whole TA and the B study, including 1,002 patients. And as you see here, the higher the level of the FGF23 uh, in the serum, the higher the uh, adjusted total kidney volume. Uh, other biomarkers, like the microglobulin and the urinary monocyte chemoattractant protein here, the higher the level the, of the beta-2 microglobulin excretion, microgram per 24 hour, as you see here, the higher the reduction of the estimated GFR in these patients. And the same, the higher the urinary uh, monocyte chemoattractant protein per milligram, uh, nanogram per 24 hour, the higher the risk of reduction of the kidney function as shown by reduction of estimated GFR. So it seems that biomarker may help in prediction of uh, progression of polycystic kidney disease. Let me to go di rapidly to other risk factors for progression. This one of the risk factors that I want to address with you is creation of AV fistula or arteriovenous graft predict, can predict the uh, development or progression of kidney disease or uh, uh, reduction of the residual kidney function significantly after creation of the vascular access? Your answer was yes, but the data shows reverse. So this is the patient's flow of the study. So we have 3,000 patients who had catheter uh, placement, uh, and this is 3,000 who were subjected to the arterial venous access. Here, without AV fistula or AV graft, and this is with AV fistula or, and, or AV graft in unadjusted analysis. This is a situation before. So the situation before is similar. But after creation of AV fistula and graft, what happened? Decrease. The degree of reduction is reduced. Mm -hmm. This means that creation of AV fistula okay. is not uh, associated with drastic reduction of residual kidney function. 
This means it's not associated with increasing the progression of chronic kidney disease. And it may be beneficial. And this is after adjustment of the analysis, the same. The creation of fistula or graft uh, is associated with a beneficial effect on the rate of progression of chronic kidney disease. And this is a very interesting data. Look, Dr. Karim, even if the fistula doesn't mature, there is no maturation. In non-maturation, again, there is some benefit uh, for the patients who were subject to EV fistula or graft creation. The explanation may be from previous observational studies and according to the discussion, maybe due to creation of the fistula reduced hypoxia or other mediators or other pathways. Uh, so, but uh, I, here I cannot recommend creating a fistula to reduce the progression of CKD. No, it is not, it's not the message. The message is if the patient uh, is afraid of creating a fistula and he is suspecting that if he creates, if the fistula is created, this means that he will rapidly uh, lose uh, the uh, kidney function. This is this data are assuring the reverse will happen. So fistula creation is not a risk factor for CKD progression, but it is to the reverse protects against mm -hmm. rapid progression. Regarding the issue of partial or radical nephrectomy and the development of chronic kidney disease. Here, this is the, I, I take this study that includes 14,000 patients, just to conclude that if we can manage renal tumor by partial nephrectomy, it is the case. Because radical nephrectomy is associated with reduction of renal mass, so the, it is axiomatic to expect that the reduction was, will be significant. But more importantly, survival also is drastically affected by radicality of management. So partial nephrectomy, if feasible, is more preferred. Patient. And is, this is, uh, as you see here in this slide, the post-operative estimated GFR according to partial. And um, here, the blue color is radical. So there is reduction of GFR more than the partial one. And it is accepted or expected. Lung dysfunction, another risk factor showing that the uh, human body is one unit. So the presence of abnormality enforced vital capacity is associated. Those patients who have low forced vital capacity are more prone to CKD. Regarding the monocyte count, is there in a relationship between monocyte count and the CKD? This study addresses this issue association between monocyte count and the risk of insulin CKD and the progression to indecision kidney disease. And as you see here, the study includes a large cohort of patients, one million, one and a half million. And here, the higher the, C, uh, the monocyte counts, the higher the risk of doubling of serum creatinine and the higher risk of uh, reducing symmetry of R by more than 30% and the higher the risk of indecision kidney disease. So the monocyte count, is it inflammation or, or why the correlation, it, it needs further study because to count, to count monocytes is an easy test, okay? Hypertriglycinemia also is bad. And the higher the quartile, these are the quartiles of triglycerides in male and females. This quartile one, quartile two, quartile three, and quartile four. If the here, and this is the uh, over 30% decline in cement GFR, here it is 0.7%, here it is 1.7. So, and this is the other unadjusted odds ratio, it is 2.3 folds higher with hypertriglycidemia. So, this is another risk factor. Impact of hypoalbuminemia, these are the quartile of serum albumin either uh, above 4.2, between 4 to and 4.2, between 3.8 and 4, or less than 3.8. What happens here? Bare uh, standard division decrease of serum albumin. There is increase in the, uh, the odds ratio uh, of the uh, security. Regarding the air pollution, this study address the issue of particulate matter 
air pollution uh, as evidenced by fine particulate matter uh, in the range of in this range and here in this study including two million person they, there is a relationship between the this uh, the quartile of BM 2.5 and the occurrence of uh, coronary kidney disease as you see the higher the B, uh, this particulate matter 2.5 microgram per square meter, uh, the higher the risk, the hazard risk for estimate for decline of estimated GFR and for interstitial kidney disease. Another factor is urinary fibrinogen. There is a data showing the, uh, that urinary fibrinogen may predict the CKD. Regarding some advances in very rapid manner, because I, I know when I speak about advances, it will be very, very difficult. Genetics and work on genome, we need further studies to show, the, show us which genetic polymorphism or genome assessment is associated with CKD progression. So we are waiting studies in this issue. And the epigenetic interaction of the environment with uh, chromosomes and genetic, it may culminate in increasing CKD so we need to address the issue of epigenetics in more and more research and depth. Regarding using of proteomics, proteomics is the protein expression of the gene. So it is the product of the gene in a protein and a polypeptide. So this study shows that proteomics can help in discovering the decline of kidney function. Uh, and here, these are the total cohort showing all these proteins that is correlated with uh, progression. So the, all these are serum uh, polypeptides that can be correlated with CKD and the CKD pro progression. And the editorial comment about this article stated that the possibilities to improve kidney health with proteomics. Uh, and in summary, proteomics is expected to give important contributions to clinical nephrology in the coming year. Uh, similar statements have repeatedly been brought forward over the last 10 years, but the technology is now further refined, simplified, and more available. And so hopefully, we will begin to see proteomics-based diagnostic and therapeutic products incorporated into clinical care. So we are waiting further studies, and it seems we are in here, because this one of the studies showing the proteomic in urine. Uh, so it is CKD. 273 uh, classifier. So they look at this polypeptide in urine and it can help a lot because the, if this is the natural history, this is a healthy individual and here we are waiting the evidence for proteinuria here and then organ failure occur here. So if we apply the proteomics we can and the molecular uh, diagnosis, so there is a molecular alteration that can be backed up by studying a proteomics and this is a rationale of early diagnosis that may help in improving the outcome and this is a history of the major milestones in the history of CKD 273 implementation from the early beginning up to that in the last 2016 FDA letter of support the uh, this test and it seems it is effective to screen diabetic patients by CKD uh, in comparison to urinary albumin, although it is costly. And here, the urinary, urinary proteomics predict onset of microalbuminuria. So if we test the patient by this CD, CKD 273 classifier, we can even pick up those who will develop microalbuminuria before development of microalbuminuria. And I think this will be a, a major advan advantage so the, again, the only barrier for the universal application of proteomic is the technology and the cost. And I think by years, both yeah. barriers will be uh, solved. We can measure total kidney volume by MRI, and these are the risk factors for high total kidney volume. The most important here is diabetic, and for low total kidney volume, the most important is the low estimated GFR. So we can know, we can look at total kidney volume as an index of the kidney. 
uh, other uh, advantages or advances in the radiology. Uh, here, this is this study for including 148 non CKD and 227 patients with CKD. And here, they addressed the issue of association of renal elasticity. So, here, that the study is to measure renal elasticity and the renal function progression in patients with coronary kidney disease evaluated by real time ultrasonography elastography. So ultrasound elastography may help us a lot. And as you see, with the progression of CKD, so these are the CKD stages, and this is the elasticity. With the uh, advancement of CKD, uh, uh, renal elasticity is reduced. And this is for, uh, and these are non-CKD with diabetes, and here non-CKD without diabetes. So it seems that the uh, renal elasticity measuring elasticity, liver elasticity, kidney to liver elasticity ratio may help us to predict the nature of the disease. So if you look here, non-CKD is 75. In a stage, advanced stages, you will find it dropped to 36. So it seems that we need further tests, further radiological diagnostic modalities in the future. MRI may help us a lot to even here to diagnose renal fibrosis. A lot of advances in MRI can tell us about the histopathology of the kidney, so we are waiting further studies. Gross differentiation 15 uh, can, be, can, can, can also be incriminated in the progression of CKD. And this is, if you look here, the, in these two cohort of patients, the, uh, the higher this, the gross differentiation factor 15, if you look here, the, the the higher the progression because here in the very high level of uh, gross differentiation factor 15 there is is associated with significant reduction in the estimated gfr or decline per year in this cohort and this seattle cohort study again gross differentiation factor 15 is associated with progression of ckd maybe adaptive proteins so I think it is very difficult to absorb all these data, but it's better to review these uh, uh, pathways because it helps us. Another interesting data is mitochondrial dysfunction. As you see here, if there is ischemia or hypertension, you find uh, disturbance of in mitochondrial environment leading to inflammation, apoptosis, uh, uh, fibrosis, cell injury, and so this either leads to acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. So mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the players in uh, predisposing the patient to acute and chronic kidney disease. And here, this is, the, this is the review about pharmacological approach to improve mitochondrial function in acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. And if you review this table, you'll find all these are experimental studies done in rat or mice showing a multitude of uh, uh, molecules working on this, the issue of mitochondrial dysfunction, reducing oxidative damage. And uh, currently we have phase 2A trial, human, about SS31 molecule, this molecule, which is known as elamipiratide during renal angioplasty with stenting. So we're awaiting the result of this study. And another study, phase 4 trial, was MITO-Q, uh, as a dietary supplement for CKD. This is the name of the trial, but it's not yet open for recruitment. So it seems that in the future, we'll find drugs working on mitochondrial dysfunction. Extracellular vesicles, the extracellular vesicles are either exosomes, micro vesicles, or apoptotic bodies, according to their size. So the size dictate the type. And it is very simple to know that we can play with cellular vesicles that can transmit signals inside the cell or outside the cell. So we can play with the, these uh, uh, micro vesicles to uh, target the immune modulation, hemostasis, angiogenesis, matrix modulation, tissue degeneration, adhesion, and the proliferation. And it seems that there is link between extracellular vesicles and vasculitis, atypical hemorrhagic remote syndrome, etc. So 
it seems that we want to understand a lot of issues in the basic research to know how to deal with the patients. Uh, another axis, which is heart-brain kidney interaction. If you look here, we have afferent and efferent, and here if we have two pathways. This is beta-1 adrenergic receptor is stimulation is linked with renin and angiotensin system, and the beta-2 adrenergic receptor is associated with kidney macrophage releasing uh, cytokines that can lead to hypertrophy. So there is interrelationship, so we can play with all these axes. Uh, tonicity responsive enhancer binding protein, this is the molecule, which here, hyperglycemia, increases this molecule, tonicity responsive enhancer binding protein, that increases M1. What's meant by M1? It is type of macrophage, which is pro-inflammatory. And this can lead to excess inflammation and the kidney injury. So again, we can play with this axis too. CD36, this is another axis here. This is a site of CD36, and it is uh, to the, related to the fatty acids. And at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, it is associated with all these pathways that can lead to progression of chronic kidney disease. And this is the mechanistic approach. The innervation and the modul moduling of innervation, so if you look here, innervation can lead to the acetylcholine acetyl transferase uh, positive uh, T cells that uh, is, uh, lead to suppression of macrophage, suppression of release of pro-inflammatory cytokine and reduce the inflammation and or tissue injury. So if we can increase this type of cells, we can change the inflammation. So it seems that working on innervation, moduling innervation, and all of us know renal denervation, and we are waiting the development in safe techniques for renal denervation. And this is the, all these are the studies, either preclinical or clinical, for the use of neuromodulation. Collectin 11 promotes the development of the, uh, renal tubular interstitial fibrosis. And the, uh, also the endothelial glycocalyx may be involved in these issues. Microvascular function can be assessed in human. And uh, the, uh, as you see, disturbance of microvascular function can lead to uh, organ dysfunction, brain, heart, kidney, and retina. So this is the very rapid tour in the advanced molecules, just to be aware that a lot of uh, research are ongoing, either experimental, or some of them are being tested nowadays in human trials, and we are waiting the product of these researches, because this may refine the management of chronic kidney disease. So to conclude this workshop, this is the last sector of the three workshop, three presentation. If you look here, this is the map of, of what? This is a global distribution of nephrologists, bare one million population. So if you find the green color, mean that there is a sufficient number of nephrologists. And here in Egypt, we have sufficient number of nephrologists. We are in this range, more than 15 nephrologists per million population. So we should do our best to change, to overcome the development and the progression of chronic kidney disease. And if I go to the, my presentation that I, I delivered within the SNT CKD chapter last Thursday, and the title was, Are We Doing Enough? I think no. the answer is big no. Why big no, Dr. Samar? Because the prevalence of endocytic kidney disease is increasing every year. And there is, uh, the, uh, we are needing more and more transplantation in Dallas every year. This means that we should do our best to reduce the progression of CKD toward in the kidney disease. And if we succeed to prevent the CKD at all, this will be a great success. But if even if we succeed to slow the progression, I think it is a satisfactory success. We need to educate the people, increase the awareness for the side effects of uh, many drugs, for the risk factors, obesity, smoking, etc., as you see in this panel and to encourage the uh, combating the bad lifestyle, improving exercise, encouraging exercise, and increasing the awareness of the population toward the healthy kidney. And I think 
this is this uh, I take this from the hypertension guidelines that was released uh, last month and as you look here all these are strong recommendation based on a very high level of evidence uh, regarding what regarding encouraging weight loss in obese persons regarding heart healthy diet such as Dutch diet or Mediterranean diet and sodium reducing sodium encouraging potassium because potassium overcomes a bad sodium effects but we should be careful in CKD or because of hyper we are afraid of hyperkalemia so uh, to deal earlier so earlier dealing with the patients improving the health or quality of life increasing physical activity and encouraging exercise all these uh, can make a big difference this is the natural history of Alport syndrome here if we start early so this is the therapy started upon macro uh, here this is the, the color therapy started upon micro hematuria or micro albuminuria so the, if we uh, deal very early what happened time to reach dialysis may even more than 45 years this is a great success but if we deal if we don't give therapy if the patient will uh, the renal survival will be drastically reduced and the patient will need dialysis in a short period of time so earlier diagnosis earlier intervention can make a big difference and we need high quality studies we need research we need to test the hypothesis to reach the solid document proving the efficacy of intervention it seems in the future that the treatment of CKD will be changed into these advances to um, attacking the abnormalities in the epigenetics or blocking fibrosis or enhancing podocyte regeneration. And this will be a great success if we reach an evidence from the research to uh, uh, reach this destination. So this is the end of the third part. I'd like to finish by repeating the question again. Both metabolic acidosis and subclinical acidosis are risk factor for CKD. True. Uh, true. And they, because they are associated with poor pathology. Subclinical acidosis defined if serum bicarb is between 20 to 22. False. False. Uh, because normal. it is normal bicarb, but there is normal problem in the bicarb. acidity. <clears throat> TRC101 increased bicarb through exchange hydrogen by sodium. No. Okay. It's false okay. because there is no exchange. Okay. It increased by carb without exchange sodium. To use anticoagulant safely is advised to monitor kidney function, yes. Uh, and according, if you use warfarin, we need more, to more, more frequent more. monitoring, especially if there is CKD. Creating a fistula increases the progression. No, no the data is showing beneficial effect. Uh, so, but we don't recommend the fistula for a, a CKD progression, but we can assure the patient that creating a fistula will not affect the residual kidney function. Collectin 11 promotes fibrosis, yes. yes. The novel CD 36 targeting peptides have shown efficacy in slowing the progression. It increases the progression, so it is false. So um, I want to end by my style of life, which is uh, we should learn. So we should, if we want to live, we should learn. We should learn. So learning, uh, and even if we teach, we learn through teaching. As physicians, we should keep learning until the end. Thank you very much for attention. And this workshop stimulates us to think of producing two special issues about the CKD progression from the clinical aspects and from the molecular aspects. And I hope that we can succeed in producing these two issues. Thank you very much and I hope if you have any question to send uh, me uh, through the email. Thank you very much.